Hey guys, welcome back to Bob Map Chem. We're going to be carrying on with Unit 1, Stoichiometry today, building on the skills that we've already started and having a look at percentage composition. Make sure you've got your whiteboard or notepad ready. Let's get into it. So we're going to be looking at how to calculate percentage composition, look at some simple examples and then also look at something called water of crystallization and how these two link. But for now, there's a question, pause the video and have a go. Okay, so the question's asking you for a quantity in moles, so we're going to do moles equals number of particles divided by Avogadro's number. Now we've got to make sure that we're paying attention to there are six oxygen atoms per molecule of glucose. So we're going to have to do six times the number of molecules divided by Avogadro's number and that gives us 2.24 moles of oxygen atoms. Okay, so today we're going to look at calculating percentage composition and we're going to use first the example that we just used, glucose, and look at why we want to work this out. We know that the relative atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.01 from the periodic table and the relative atomic mass of oxygen is 16.0. So if we have an equal amount of both of these atoms, they are not equivalent because they have a different mass. So it's important for us to understand where the mass in a compound is coming from and we use this equation to do that. So percentage composition is equal to the relative atomic mass of the element that we want to find the percentage of divided by the molecular mass of the total molecule times 100. Now in the case where there's more than one atom, what we need to do is we need to multiply the equation by the number of atoms that are present of the one we're calculating. So in this case, if we were looking at oxygen, then we, X would be equal to six. If it was hydrogen, it would be equal to 12. Now remember, you've got the molecular mass on the bottom of the fraction, so that's the molecular mass of the total molecule you're looking at, and the atomic mass is the relative atomic mass of the element in question. So this will vary depending on which element you're looking for the percentage composition. So let's look at an example then. So if we want to calculate the percentage of sodium as Na in Na2O, sodium oxide, we're going to first need to calculate the molecular mass of the total molecule, which is going to be two times sodium plus oxygen, and that equals 61.98. Once we've got that value though, the question isn't over. We want to find the percentage composition. So we're going to do two because that's how many atoms of sodium there are times 22.99 over the total just a little reminder of your equation then multiplied by 100 and that's 74.18 percent okay let's do another example before we let you loose on some questions so here calculating the percentage composition of hydrogen in water so we're going to follow the same process that we did in the last question we're going to calculate the molecular mass first which is 18.02 and then we're going to do two because there's two hydrogens in water multiplied by 1.01 divided by 18.02 multiplied by 100 which is 11.2 percent awesome so let's get you trying a question here's the first one i want you to calculate the percentage of hydrogen in magnesium hydroxide pause the video and have a go at that pop them up so hopefully here you got two times 1.01 over 58.33 which is the molecular mass of the total molecule times 100 equals 3.46 percent and we can use the same principles to determine the percentage composition of water in hydrated salts, like this copper sulfate. So in this situation, we're referring to how many waters are surrounding the copper sulfate. So it's important to recognize that these are not covalent bonds. These aren't directly sharing electrons with the copper sulfate. And 
This is known as the water of crystallization. And the water of crystallization refers to, is that the, this represented by this little dot in uh, the CUSO4, just there. And it tells us something about the nature of those interactions, about those long range bonding interactions. But the most important part is, is we can use what we already know to calculate this. So let's have a look at a simple example where we're not trying to calculate the water of crystallization, we're just trying to calculate the percentage of water. So as usual, I'm going to need to calculate my molecular mass of the salt. Now when I calculate my molecular mass, I'm going to do my mass of the salt plus the mass of water times the water of crystallization. So I'm going to do seven times the mass of water and that equals 246. Then I use my molecular mass of water and I just plug in where I would have plugged in my atomic mass. I'm going to replace that with the molecular mass of water, but it's still the same percentage composition question. So now I just get seven times 18 over 246 times 100, which is 51.2%. So here's a little question for you calculating the water in sodium sulfate. If you pause the video and have a go at that one. Once again, you've got to first find the molecular mass of the entire salt, including the molecular mass of the water. So you're going to add that together. Remember to multiply the water by the water of crystallization value, which in this case is 10. And then we're going to do the molecular mass of water divided by the molecular mass of the total multiplied by our water of crystallization, which in this case is equal to 55.9%. However, we might not always know the value of X, our water of crystallization. You can see for this cobalt chloride, it's got a value of six here, but this may be unknown. Maybe we had an anhydrous salt and we stored it in humid conditions or we've been storing a salt for a long period of time and we may not be exactly sure of this water of crystallization. Well, we can determine this by removing the water. So it's a very simple technique. All we're going to do is we're going to take a known mass of the hydrated salt, so our salt that we want to find it for, and we're going to gently heat it in a crucible and we're going to continually weigh it after a certain period of time. So we're gonna do one heating, weigh it, second heating, maybe five minutes in between. And we're gonna to continue to weigh it until that we see no further change. So we get two measurements that are the same. And once we do this, we can use this to calculate the amount left. So let's have a look at how we might do this with an example. So in this example, we've got some hydrated copper sulfate that has an unknown water of crystallization being heated. So let's have a look for the important information in the question. So they've given us an initial mass and they've given us the formula of the salt, at least with X unknown. And they've given us a final mass where we've got to a constant weight. So the first thing we want to calculate is the change in mass. So we have an initial and we have a final mass and we're going to make an assumption. And that assumption is that all the mass that we lose is due to water. Now this may be a limitation of this experiment because we may lose other mass, but that's the assumption we're gonna make for the sake of the calculation. So mass of water is gonna be equals to 2.25 grams. Now the way we're gonna set this up is we're gonna use our number of moles equals mass over MR equation. And we're gonna use that to make a ratio between the copper sulfate and the water of crystallization. Just bear in mind, my little equation in the top right should be mass divided by MR for molecular mass, not mass over mass equals moles, of course. So let's set this up in two columns and we'll find the molecular mass of copper sulfate in our left column, which is 160, and our molecular mass of water, which is 18. And then underneath, we're going to do those calculations. So for copper sulfate, we know that the mass left over at the end was the anhydrous copper sulfate. So our number of moles is gonna equals 
0.0 divided by 160, which equals 0.025 moles. And for our water, we know that the difference was the mass. So that's 2.25 divided by 18, which is 0.125. Now we want these as a proportion to each other. So the easiest way for us to get that is to divide through both of them by the smallest value. So you can see here, that's the copper sulfate. So we divide through by 0.025 to both of them, which gives us a value of one and five respectively. So that now means we have the ratio of copper sulfate to water, and therefore our value of X in this case is five because we have a one to five ratio. And that is how we determine the water of crystallization. So got three main steps that we can kind of recap here. So we've got finding the molecular mass, the moles and the ratio. Those three steps are going to give you the water crystallization. So I'd like you to have a go at this question, determining the water of crystallization. You can pause the video, but feel free to go back and have a look at the other question for the techniques and the methodology, if that's going to be helpful to you. Okay, going through this question, then the first thing we want to do is we want to find out how much water was lost by taking the end mass of anhydrous salt away from the initial mass. So we know we got 5.8 grams of water. So now we set it up as we did before, we find the molecular mass of our zinc sulfate, which is 161.38 grams per mole. And we do the same with water, which is 18 as always, or 18.02 if you used the proper calculations. So we've worked out our molecular mass. Now we need to work out our number of moles using the masses from the question and the water loss that we've calculated. So the mass from the question we had is 7.4 grams divided by our molecular mass. And that equals 0.045 moles for the zinc sulfate. And we do the same with our water lost for water, which is 0.32 moles. That's our second step. Now, the last step, remember, is we want to find the ratio. So we're going to find the smallest, which is going to be our zinc sulfate. We're going to divide both values by 0.045, which gives us one for zinc sulfate. And when we divide our water, we get seven. So we have a value of seven for X. That's a one to seven ratio. So our water of crystallization is seven in this case. So don't worry if it's taking you a bit of time to get adjusted to all of the steps in these kinds of questions. That's part of the learning curve. And the best thing you can do is to practice. So next things I want you to do are to watch the video walkthrough guide of this practical and complete the questions in the practical workbook on this, as well as most importantly, the worksheet workbook, which are also stored in the lesson folder on your Teams class too. Thanks for joining me again, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, please like, subscribe, and share the videos with anyone who you think will benefit. And as always, practice makes slightly better.